Uh, so I'll uh, now make the introductions and we can begin. Uh, so I'm pleased to introduce uh, Chris Rogers from Cambridge, uh, who will be speaking about things uh, we think we know. Very good. Well, well, thank you very much, Lane. Thank you to Georges for all of the organization. Um, I, I find the sort of the virtual conference uh, format doesn't uh, doesn't work so well for me as real real conferences. Um, so I do apologize to my colleagues um, whose excellent talks I may have missed because I was at the virtual beach at the time. But anyway, um, I have less to say than Joseph had. Um, this talk uh, goes back to a, a meeting a couple of years ago in Jerusalem and, and Bruno was there, but I don't think anybody else listening was. Um, so it's a, a somewhat abbreviated version, but um, it's, it's a sort of a kind of... Uh, wandering through uh, issues of model choice um, and you know these are these are issues that that we all encounter um, in, in pretty much everything we do and you know we're given some data and and in in this gathering we might be thinking of say financial data and we may have a natural choice for a model so um, it might be that we think black trolls would be a natural choice for a diffusion or a log levy model but of course there are several natural choices um, you might have a stochastic vol model where the vol and the, and the underlying a uh, 2d diffusion you might have a local vol model you might have a, a rough vol story you might have some sort of regime switching you might think about garch and what's natural um, really depends on your background and your training i guess as much as anything else um, but you could pick um several different possible models and they would all be in some ways comparably good uh, at explaining the data but when you try and pick a model from a, a range of possibilities i've always found it helpful to um, ask supplementary questions i mean it a lot of people will say okay we've got a stock how do we how do we model the the movement of the stock but i would always say before you close in on a particular model you want to know does this model actually agree with stylized facts um, and then you might ask yourself how does this model generalize to multiple assets i mean does it generalize to multiple assets can you do this in such a way that you have some non-trivial dependence between the assets um, so if your model is not capable of generalization to a high dimensions then um i i suggest to you that you think again <laughs> um and uh some of these models may be more natural in continuous time or in discrete time and there's nothing wrong with discrete time models but it's also um rather pleasing if uh, you're able to see a discrete time model as something that's uh, say a, a discrete time observation of something that was actually happening in continuous time if that happens to be um, a, a, a sort of natural context. So, you know, obviously things like Garch are a discrete time model. Um, and that's fine if you want to talk about, say, daily price moves. But um, Garch doesn't aggregate well. If you look at every other day of the, of the Garch model, it's not a Garch model. So, you know, there, there's all sorts of reasons like this. And, and actually, before we invest too much time in any one particular um model choice I, I always think it's worth just you know look around before you dig in <clears throat> now i highlighted the rough vol um choice there because that's what i want to be talking about mainly today and so i've you know i've dug out some data and these are the data from the oxford man website so um neil shepherd and his pals there have uh, done a lot of good work on taking high frequency data and then forming um, uh, daily estimates of vol uh, constructed, constructed from the tick data. Now, <clears throat> um, Jim Gatherall and his co-authors, Jason Rosenbaum, have, uh, have dug into this, and they look at the, uh, at the, uh, the, the, the volatilities that, that come out of this, this data set or, or comparable data sets, and um, you look at the, and the change of the log vol over intervals from t to t plus delta t. So you're, you're, you're trying to essentially 
um, understand the order Q variation of um, the log of the volatility. And they come up with a rather remarkable finding that, that this uh, quantity, so uh, the order Q variation with lag delta, uh, so depending on two, uh, two parameters, appears to satisfy some kind of universal uh, law that if you uh, vary um, delta, then M varies as delta to the alpha Q. Um, and also um, that uh, as you vary Q, uh, you, you get this, this very uh, pleasing relationship. And that's uh, uh, pretty surprising. They get it for a, a decent range of values of Q from a half to three and for delta measured in days from one to about 50. So it's a, it's a surprisingly robust conclusion um, from the data. Um, the alpha that appears in the, in the exponent there is usually in the range from about 7 to 20 percent. There doesn't seem to be any um, you know, preferred value there. There's quite a, a widespread of possible alpha values. Um, but for any particular asset, uh, the, the alpha seems to be um, you know, good over a wide range of deltas and Qs. <clears throat> and another feature that they find is that if you look at the increments, of the uh, log volatility, it does suggest that, you know, by looking at QQ plots, you, it suggests that the distribution of these increments should be Gaussian. Okay, and, and here are some pictures that you get if you um, take some data. So this is the S&P 500. Um, and on the top left panel, we see the, um, the volatility estimates, basically what's coming from um, the, uh, um, the Oxford Mann Group's data, and just to see, uh, you know, how sort of time homogeneous this thing might be, if you just look at the cumulative sum of squares of the increments, um, it's going up pretty much in a straight line. If you do QQ plots on these things, it's remarkably close to straight line, um, straight line uh, uh, slopes there. So it's 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 pretty good. And then if we look at the log of m against the log of delta. So we should be seeing straight lines for different values of the exponent Q. And, you know, the picture doesn't do too badly on that. Then if we look at the FTSE, you know, qualitatively, it's pretty similar. Nikkei, DAX, not perhaps quite so good on the QQ plots. Australian, Bovespa, of course, since it's Rio. Um, MIB, and a bunch of other smaller indices are all generating pictures that are qualitative, qualitatively very, very similar. OK, so what about a model for this? Well, um, Gatherall et al. proposed that log of sigma hat, which I'm abbreviating to X here, is a fractional brown in motion, which would which would fit with the, um, the the quadratic variation or the order Q variation findings that they come up with. So I would say that the increments of X over um, over intervals would be uh, normally distributed zero mean and the variance proportional to the length of the interval to the power to alpha. So alpha equals a half would be the classical Brownian case. And they're proposing that we could model um, X in this way. <clears throat> now, fractional Brownian motion, as anyone who's ever looked at it knows, has got a, has got a long memory. In fact, it's got an infinite memory. Um, and gather all I'll say, the evidence for long memory has never been sufficient to satisfy remaining doubters such as Mikosh and Starika, if that's his, where you pronounce his name. OK, I mean, you know, they're, 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 they're taking these poor, poor colleagues of ours and, and, and holding them up to the up to the fire. Um, uh, <laughs> but um, okay, uh, I, I know Thomas Mikosh very well, and and uh, I, I can well believe that he would be a, a doubter. But um, FBM seems to fit the observations really quite well, as the as the previous plots showed. So why would you want to doubt it? Well, I mean, one thing is that it's highly not Markovian. If you're going to make a statement about how X is going to evolve in the future, it's not good enough just to know where X is. 
in fact um you really need to know the entire history of the path to be able to make statements about how the um the the future will go there's no conditional independence of, of um, future and past so this makes it a very very difficult uh, object to work with and quite aside from the sort of practicalities of working with this model um, one of the things that i find uh, difficult here um, is that there's no it's, it's really hard to tell a story or some sort of economic story which would lead you to uh, uh, the conclusion that the future evolution of volatility should depend on the entire history now okay i know you could say well it doesn't matter if you just had the last three days of the data that would be enough well yeah but why should it depend on you know even the last three days why three days why not five why not two so from the point of view of, of modeling i.e you know a, a story that comes from from primitives it's it's to my taste not very satisfactory another thing that to my mind weakens this as a, as a modeling assumption is that the exponent alpha is not universal so when we move from one market to another from one asset to another we'll find the the um this kind of power law behavior but the alpha will be different and maybe there are other statistics than the order q variation that actually don't match particularly well which hasn't been um perhaps as well examined as it might be but you know the the response could well be can the doubters offer anything better <laughs> And if they can't, well, um, they, they should shut up. OK, well, let's uh, take uh, another look at some of these pictures. And they, as you can see, I mean, they all basically look like this. Is, is there some alternative model that we could propose that might fit the kind of pictures that we're seeing? So I want to sort of focus particularly on the top left panel. So this is the essentially the raw data. And so what we see here is we saw, see something that's extremely fuzzy. I mean, this, uh, this trace is moving up and down very, very fast. Um, the, if you like, the thickness of this trace um, doesn't change a great deal over time, but the level of the trace is going up and down. Okay. Now, if we saw uh, a trace here where it was a, a very very fastly fast moving but of more or less constant thickness but at a fixed level then the obvious model for that would be an ou process with a high variance and a high mean reversion okay so now maybe what we should be thinking of in terms of, of modeling this data is that actually it is an ou process with a very high variance and a very high mean reversion, but actually being pulled back to some slowly varying level. OK. So how does that look? So this is, I would propose, an alternative model that you could take for this data. So here we have, OK, just to sort of fix some ideas, we've, we're taking x is the is the observation it's the, the the track i was showing you on the previous slide take a very large variance sigma x squared is 20. the lambda the mean reversion here is strong and it's it's 210 in this particular um, in the examples we're going to see and then there's a sort of more slowly moving sort of center value for the uh, for the trace which is an ou process with a much smaller variance and a much smaller mean reversion so if you do this what kind of pictures do we see i mean well actually you've already seen it because a few slides ago i slipped through amongst all of the actual data i slipped through um, a fictitious index the fix 2000 is actually not a real index at all it's the fictitious index and it was generated by the model you see at the top of the slide here and yet you know the picture that you're seeing looks just like all of the others <laughs> okay so it you know once you see this you you recognize that actually this very simple two-dimensional diffusion is visually at least um fitting the data just as well 
as the fractional Brownian motion model. But with this guy, it's a two-dimensional Markov process and one's got a chance of actually doing something. Okay, so what features do we got? It's a bivariant linear Gaussian diffusion. So the distributions are always Gaussian. That's, in, uh, that's consistent with the observation that Gatherall et al made. Um, it seems to fit the daily data just as well as the rough fold model. I think it's easier to tell some kind of story. I think, you know, one could um, you know, make make a story about some sort of, you know, level of, uh, of, 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 of market energy. And then you might have some sort of uh, local kind of um, uh, noise on top of that. Um, and if you use a model of this kind, we're really sort of looking at a, a multi-scale stochastic volatility model. And, you know, the techniques of Papa Nicolau et al. Um, give us uh, very good ways of, um, of option pricing in this context. So anyway, let me, let me take the, the uh, bottom right plot for the fixed 2000. But now I'm going to change it because previously I was only showing you the plot from here to the right. So here is is basically the this is where the the Oxford data kind of runs out. This this corresponds to delta equals one day, and in the Oxford data you have delta equals you know two days, three days, four days, blah blah blah. But what I'm plotting here in the dotted lines, this is the the straight line fit that you would be getting from the um, the fractional Brownian motion model. So the fractional Brownian motion model says we should get a straight line fit. When I take the, the, the data given by the points, these straight lines are what you'd fit to that data. The curves here, however, are what you'd get from the two dimensional, um, you know, the bivariate Gaussian diffusion on the previous slide. And we can calculate these things because we know exactly what the, uh, the process is. So we can calculate what the, what the, uh, the fit would be. So the, the true uh, fit for the fixed 2000 would be these these solid curves and as you can see the data is is pretty close to those curves but in the region where we have the data for um, time lags of, of one day two days up to 50 days the agreement is 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 very very close I mean it's hard to tell the difference between the straight lines and the curves if we were going to detect a difference between the two models, if we were going to try and decide, is it is it a fractional Brownian motion model or is it a bivariate Gaussian diffusion? The place we're going to have to look is here. Yeah, this is where the the two predictions of the model start to vary um, substantially. And what is this? Well, this is the region where we've got time intervals that are much much shorter than a day. Now, the Oxford Man data doesn't go to any um, time interval less than a day. So we have to go and find some high frequency data, dig into it and see what we can find out from that. OK, so I, I managed to get hold of some um, WTI, WTI futures tick data. I got seven days worth of this stuff from a, a, a friend in the business. Um, and then I'll take one minute time bins for this. Um, cut out all market close times and I, I'm just going to count the number of moves in each bin in each one minute time bin okay and this is a, a, a reasonably good proxy for sigma squared because you know it, sigma squared is is measuring the speed of a diffusion um, and the speed of a Poisson process is going to be measured by the rate so that would be the number of moves in a one minute time interval We'll use this as our estimate of the squared fault. And what do we see if we do that? Well, we see uh, here, we see the, 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 the vol estimates that come out of that. Um, and, you know, similarly, we get a more or less linear growth in the cumulative sum of squared returns. QQ plots, again, um, not too far off linear. But now we're, in, when we look at these, these uh, shorter um, time intervals, it's you know, there's a reasonably good um, linear plot there. So um, maybe that says actually um, fractional Brownian motion isn't such a stupid model at all. Okay. <clears throat> well, maybe yes, maybe no. 
let's actually zoom in on a little piece of the of the data. So this is um, this is a plot of of the log vol as as I um, defined it earlier. The log of the vol um, on a minute by minute basis. So we've got like I don't know however many hundred minutes we're looking at there, and you know even even thinking that these are uh, minutely data. This is this is moving around extremely violently. I mean, remember the log is we're, we're running from sort of 0.5 up to 2.5. So the fact that uh, the, the difference in the 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 estimated one minute vols is varying by a factor of you know of the order of e squared. So it's sort of maybe you know the the, the slow times are, are like a tenth of the uh, the activity of the of the active times. So this is. This isn't looking anything like a, um, you know, something that's particularly sort of steady. Um, but what happens if we take out the line? Because actually, that was just a linear inter uh, interpolation of, of point data. So if we just look at the point data, um, I mean, it's it's like somebody's been, you know, throwing darts at the at the board, isn't it? And the, there's holes all over this thing. Um, and you know maybe actually the model should be that we've got some more un regular underlying process so there might be something that's kind of you know moving like this and that we've got some or maybe it's it's a bit wilder um and then there's just there's just additive noise you put some iid noises on top of it okay so that might be a another another model there's there's no reason a priori to suppose that the process for the log vol, even if it's a, a, a meaningful, meaningful thing to talk about, there's no reason to suppose that they should have a continuous sample path, none at all. Um, if we look at the, the slopes of log M of Q of delta against log delta, so the things that we were, the slope line, the straight line approximations in the bottom right hand panel of all of the pictures, <clears throat> here we've got. Um, in the first two columns, we're seeing for that data, we're seeing what would happen if we did um, the FBM fit. And rather surprisingly, I mean, or maybe not surprisingly, maybe this is the thing that that um, Gatherall et al were, were coming up with is that even when we go down to these uh, quite short intraday timescales, the uh, linear dependence between log M and log delta um is is pretty decent okay so maybe maybe fractional brown emotion when you go down to that really short time scale is is still a good idea but on the other hand if you don't buy the suggestion that that this process whatever it is ought to be continuous if you take the idea that it might be some sort of continuous process with additive random iid random noises added onto it then if you look at the moving averages you just take a average of, of of two neighbors or average of three neighbors right with equal weights if you just do some sort of simple moving average and you do the same thing then what you're finding is that um, with the moving average of three you're finding a sort of asymptotic behavior that looks much more like the 0 0.5 you get for a diffusion model so maybe um maybe this is this is the correct interpretation maybe this is the correct interpretation um but ultimately in a way it, it kind of doesn't matter too much i think because um if you can only distinguish these two models um when you go down to time scales of the order of minutes um or less um, then it doesn't really matter if all you care about is what's going to happen over the time, time scales of the order of days or weeks, which is, after all, what you're going to do when it comes to derivative pricing, right? I mean, you're going to buy an option that's a, a two-month option or a three-month option. You're trying to explain the moves of, uh, of an underlying process um, over, over many days or weeks. So if if these models only differ at very very short time scales for all practical purposes in my view um the, there's 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 nothing uh, to argue uh, in favor of one or the other apart from 
other considerations like tractability or um, plausibility. OK, I mean, so I didn't really have an awful lot to say, but let me wrap up. So, you know, you do an exploratory data analysis and calculating all of these order Q variations is an exploratory data analysis. And this may point to a particular model, but, you know, it's important not to, uh, you know, choose the very first thing you think of, but to keep an open mind. It's like, you know, it's like in police work, if you want. I mean, don't assume that the first person who looks like a suspect has actually done it. Um, you know, you, you you come up with a model and then you it's it worked well on a, a bunch of, of data that you looked at. But does it work well if you move outside the initial context? And this is really just a good science. You, you, you have form a hypothesis on the basis of um, some observations, but you then uh, go out from that uh, uh, initial uh, place and, and see if it works more widely. It seems to me that rough ball and the OU plus OU do fit the daily data equally well. So, it, you know, in terms of, uh, of, of uh, a model that makes sense um, uh, from the data point of view, either is good, but I think the the, the second is, is obviously much easier to work with. Um, Neither, I think, completely explains data on a one minute time scale, but, um, you know, that, that's, that's a study that perhaps we don't need to get too deeply into. Why would we care, as I said? And for times of, of it to expire the order of weeks, then the, uh, the, the sort of the multiple time scale methods of Papa Nicolau et al. are effective for derivative pricing. So somehow, um, in terms of stochastic volatility, I think we haven't really gone very much further than we had like 20 years ago. Anyway, those are just some thoughts. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Well, Chris, thank you very much. And again, uh, a virtual round of applause, you know, from a lot of And uh, I'm just looking at the chat to see uh, if we... Uh, have any comments? And uh, while I wait for one or two remarks to come in, I'll just make a kind of a general uh, question of sort. This is more sort of philosophical, but it it seems that one general principle that one applies in scientific and mathematical investigations, and certainly is applicable here, is some versions of some version of Occam's razor. In other words, one wants the uh, simplest possible model that will sort of do the job. You know, uh, but but that can't be the whole story because sometimes there are more complicated models, uh, you know, and uh, maybe models involving uh, rough paths and the like are good illustrations of this or fractional Brownian motion, more complicated uh, models where uh, uh, nevertheless, the complication turns out to be just the ingredient that one needs, you know, and you've presented a situation where one can go either way, you know, with varying degrees of success and, and so forth. So what is your view on what is the the, the overall best approach on such matters? Uh, and this is a very open question, of course. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess, I guess I, 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 I'm always rather sort of, um, I, I, I take a practical point of view. I, I, I mean, you know, 30 years ago, I might have been uh, wowed by lots of uh, beautiful analysis. Um, as I get older, I get more cynical about these things. And, and I like to think, well, what does this allow me to do? You know, what will this model do for me? It may be beautiful. It may be there may be sort of all kinds of lovely properties and, and results and theorems and stuff. But what does it allow me to do? And if it doesn't allow me to do something that I, I, I couldn't do before, um, then why should I make the effort to, uh, to, to, to get into this stuff? You know, that's, that's a personal point of view, motivated entirely by laziness. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, so, so, uh, form of my, my sense is that we, 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 need to keep, we need to keep close to, to close to what it is we're actually trying to do. What is useful? Let's bear that in mind all the time. Yeah, very good. Well, on that note, uh, I've noticed that there are several people in the chat room who say that they would like to talk to you at the virtual coffee break. Uh, following on uh, Julian and uh, Jim Gatherall and Georgia. I, I would have expected no less from Jim. And, that's for uh, sure. Martino Grisselli and uh, one or two others. So 
uh, we can postpone the rest of the questions until then and move on to Marco at this point, if that's agreeable. 